an African American student in school stands a one in three chance of being incarcerated sometime in his lifetime, and a Latino male student in the U.S. now stands a one in six chance of being incarcerated sometime in his lifetime. That's not to exclude the girls. There is a much lower uh, proportion of, of uh, girls in our uh, correctional facilities. But every day in America, every single day, over 4,000 children are arrested and over 17,000 kids are suspended from school and over 2,000 high school students drop out. We have tracked young people, especially young people of color, not to college and to the workforce, but to the juvenile court and to the adult criminal courts in a fashion that has resulted in over two million Americans being incarcerated right now. Our rate of incarceration on the adult level far exceeds any other developed nation. And it is to the point now where there are more African American males in prison than there were enslaved in 1850 in the South. When we're talking about the direct link between school and the justice system, um, I guess playing devil's advocate a little bit, there's nothing more fearful for a parent than to hear about possible violence in their child's school or something dangerous for their students. So explain maybe the distinction. I have a son who was here that was uh, in middle school uh, in a township school here and was being uh, bullied. Um, and so he defended himself, and it was just kind of, uh, you know, sort of a one-two punch thing that he engaged in just to get this individual uh, off of him. In the classroom, by the way, the teacher did not intervene or protect him. Uh, and so he received five-day suspension for that. Um, now, I, uh, of course, was outraged. Um, because there are certain things that happen in a, the culture of a middle school. Um, first of all, you have to, to a certain extent, be able to defend yourself. And, you know, whether or not you do it by way of, you know, trying to kind of talk your way out of whatever the conflict is, or, you know, you engage in some sort of defensive mechanism, there ought to be, you know, at least an adult that's able to kind of work things out between the children, rather than saying, well, you, you know, you, we have a, this policy and you're going to be sent away uh, you know, for five days without really getting to the heart, well, what exactly happened, or even resolving the fact that there is a bully present. Uh, and so if parents take comfort in the zero tolerance uh, policy, uh, then they're really uh, operating under this uh, illusion that, you know, the problems or the conflict is actually going to go away. It's not getting to the heart of what actually is causing that conflict. And I think it's beyond just the relationships that transpire in the school. Uh, there's also the frustration that a lot of uh, students have with regard to the curriculum. There's all sorts of things that take place in the classroom that lead to this uh, uh, type of conflict, the boredom, um, the focus on testing that doesn't really make the uh, learning or an educational process meaningful for the children. So of course they're going to seek other types of outlets or ways to express themselves. Um, and so, and when you have um, teachers that aren't necessarily prepared to deal with uh, peaceful mechanisms of, re of resolving conflict or even have to rely so much on testing that they don't uh, have room to have creative projects or other things going on in the classroom, uh, then it really takes a lot from uh, the entire uh, community and the entire educational process for all the children. Uh, and so that's one um, one problem with this uh, idea of zero tolerance. There are many mechanisms and many ways of resolving conflict that uh, leave the children uh, with uh, their dignity, no matter what side the conflict they're are on. And we should have learned that lesson uh, from the history that we've had in this country in the past. May I speak to that? You may. Uh, uh, you're talking about different forms of discipline. Uh, this, is a, this is a critical issue. Our culture, going back hundreds, probably thousands of years, our culture teaches us that those who do something wrong, who violate the rules, must be punished. 
And this has moved, this is very deep in our culture. And taking another approach, in other words, finding a way to solve the problem, work through the problem, instead of just uh, uh, blaming someone and then punishing them, uh, this, this isn't, uh, it, it isn't gaining speed in our society very rapidly. There are, um, uh, the, the concept of punishment actually got some scientific boost uh, it, during the 1900s, in, 19, in the 40s, B.F. Skinner, and some of you may know the Skinner box from uh, teaching a rat uh, to press one kind of lever or another lever. Uh, Dr. Skinner was the chair of the psychology department of uh, Indiana University in the 40s, uh, and the philosophy that he taught uh, was that people respond to um, uh, punishment and rewards. So, um, so our our punishment concepts. This, this this gave a little credence, a little science uh, to punishment. The idea of punishing students. So we haven't f made a powerful attempt to find a better way to deal with a situation. We have school rules. Every school has rules. It's hard to write them broad enough to cover everything. Rather than rules, something that works far more effectively is to develop a set of principles. Principles, if I say I am responsible for a given uh, whatever, uh, it's, it, it's easier for the student to absorb this, internalize this, uh, and, and accept his responsibility. For instance, we might say I'm responsible for everything I do. If I do well, I get the credit. If I mess up, I can't try to put the blame on someone else. That might be our first principle. Then another principle might be, I'm responsible for treat, treating all persons with respect and consideration. That we are different, that we look different, that we think differently doesn't matter. What matters is that each one of us is a deserving human being. Then, when the student and there is some kind of fuss in the classroom, whatever is going on, it shouldn't be. Uh, and the student is sent to the principal or the disciplinarian. Instead of meeting out uh, some, excuse me, some punishment, the disciplinarian can say, uh, would you look at the principles up here on the wall? We've been talking about those all year. Tell me, um, what did Mrs. Jones send you down here for? What was the situation? Uh, the student hems and haws, and I didn't do it, blah, blah, blah. But after a while, the uh, principal or the disciplinarian gets the information out of the student. And then, then he says, oh, okay, well, look at the principles. Is there some other way a student, and he never says you, because that makes the kid defensive. Is there some other way a student uh, might approach this kind of problem uh, that would not cause a fuss in the classroom. I'm sure there is. Take, look at the principles. See, see if you can find which one applies and, and give me an answer. We work with a kid for a few minutes on this and he'll come up with an answer. May not be a good one. If it's not a very good one, the disciplinarian still says, oh, good try, yeah. Now look again and see if we can find something more. Until you get some ideas from this student about he might respond, uh, ways he might respond to a similar situation. And he probably will come up with a better way that won't cause a fuss. When, he's, when, when the, this process is finished, the disciplinarian gives the kid a big smile, a pat on the back, and says, John, I knew you could do that. I knew all we needed to do was talk about it, and you would find a better way. And then the disciplinarian shakes hand with the child. The child should have been taught this already in school, in one of the earlier classes, but if it hasn't happened yet, then he teaches him how to shake hands. So this is the way people deliver respect to one another. And they shake hands, sends the kid back to class. A school in Indianapolis, an inner city school, that started this process in the 1990s, saw an 80% reduction of discipline 
requiring incidents in five months. Not only did they see a dramatic fall in inappropriate behavior, they found a complete reversal of attitude. The attitude was, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to do that. I, 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 can, I can find a better way. The attitude was uh, one of a friendly relationship with the disciplinarian, unlike the way we know now that 50% of seventh graders see the disciplinarian, the principal, as an adversary. They see the disciplinarian as someone to work with. One student came to this disciplinarian and said to him, this is several months into the pro program, I broke a table. I didn't mean to, but I broke it. What do I need to do? He had enough confidence in the disciplinarian. He knew he wasn't going to get punished. He knew he wasn't going to get something awful. He knew the disciplinarian would help him find a way to do what he needed to do because he felt guilty about it. He wanted to fix it somehow. So one of the things we can do to change the attitude so students don't have these problems is to teach a number of things, which there isn't time this morning for me to go in, into everything. But another thing we can do is change this discipline plan. Instead of thinking in terms of punishment, which our culture has taught us forever, think in terms of working through the idea, working through with ideas of better ways to deal with the situation. Mr. Tenenbaugh, if you could maybe address, since you work with IPS schools, what are the challenges for the schools in developing a disciplinary approach? And are there alternatives that are being explored or used right now? Well, they, they, they constantly try every day, new, something new. But uh, I just, uh, my thing is this here. You know, you can institute the uh, no tolerance, cold, zero tolerance, the death penalty. We already understand that death penalty has not deterred homicide, the killing of police officers, multiple slayings, which constitute or uh, justify one being eligible for the death penalty. It hasn't deterred people. Just recently, a man just killed five people. So that, the death penalty doesn't deter people from committing heinous crimes. So it's not about the zero tolerance or the death penalty. It's about attacking the way people think, how they see themselves, how they perceive themselves, and how they see others. This has been the thing. And, and, and particularly for African Americans, we don't know how to see ourselves as a whole. We don't even know how to identify as ourselves. Some of us call ourselves Negroes. Some write on the application that they're colored or black. Some say African American. That is a sign that we are confused about who we are and what we are. The thing of it is, is we need just, and this is the reason why I applaud the superintendent of Indianapolis Public Schools, Dr. Eugene White, and also the director of Pat Payne, who is the director of multi -edu multi cultural education, and that um, and the Christmas Addicts Museum. These two people have put their heads together and devised a program that addresses the identity of how African Americans see themselves. And so they've created this program called uh, Cultural Competency, which is they are mandating that teachers teach or infuse culture into the education program. 